Richard, what a nice name. Richard, how are you? I'm good. Are you on the way, Pacific Coast? No, I'm on the East Coast. <clears throat> well, I'm in the middle, right by Chicago. Okay. Starting to get dark. It is. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Blanton. Sonia. You're muted, Pat. Thank you. I was just commenting two nights in a row. We must be drunk. Yeah, and I was I was thinking that uh, Susan should probably be about one semester away from getting her dental ethics degree. Yeah, probably so. And if we get her into the clinic, she'll be a dentist. <laughs> oh, no, there you go. <laughs> get the light down a little bit. It's kind of bright in this room. Richard, how many people do you expect on this call tonight? Um. Suzanne said we had 46 signed up. Whoa, that's great. Yeah. That is great. It's an important topic. That it is. That it is. Good to see you too, Richard. Uh, how are the two girls doing? They're good. They're, they've got a scam going where they'll take, one of them will take me shopping for the other one. For things like Bed Bath and Beyond. Oh yeah. And the first time I walked out with an eighty-five dollar bill, I thought that's crazy. <laughs> and the next time it was more like one hundred and fifty. I was going to say you got you did pretty good with just eighty-five. Right. Bed Bath and Beyond, that's something else. But that's a great place to shop. Do you ever go in there? Only to spend money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey uh, Dick, what did you think about that uh, presentation last night? <clears throat> I really like the film. I think it's great. I made a suggestion uh, to Carol that you should beta test it with a younger generation than you and I. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're capable of, of viewing it with the same critical eye that, you know, we don't know exactly what they're looking for. I don't think we can right. appreciate that. And I also, I had a couple of experiences with, with tapes like that. And my marketing guy said, what you need to do is have a short, like 30, 60, maybe 90 second uh, video with real short clips, almost like an infomercial. Yeah. Draw them in, get their interest. Because most of them are not going to be interested in a half an hour or more. But if, if you can trigger their fancy with a real short uh, clip, yeah, I think you're right. Richard, what he's talking about is the American College is working with IDEA to create a program entitled Your Finance is Your Future to try to address the dental students' plea to uh, talk with them about what to do with student debt, how to preclude student debt and how to manage student debt in the event it occurs. So we're trying to address that uh, that really came to us as a request from young students to do something to help them. Yeah, it's the elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah. It, it has is tremendous that. impact in the future of the profession. Yeah, that latest article that Leo sent around was interesting. Although and I crunched some numbers when I graduated. Um, <laughs> compared to my classmates, I had a fairly low debt, it was $50,000. Wow, but in you... today's dollars, it's 265,000. Yeah. And I was eating soy meat and driving an old car and 
I didn't have right. any vacations. I went to McDonald's once a year as a treat. Oh, you really splurged. Okay, yeah. I went crazy. You know, I don't remember very much from those days except studying. I don't remember ever shopping, going for clothes. I never had a car. I don't remember thinking about any of that stuff. It was all about school and learning yes. and studying. But that was me. It, and it's a different group today. Well, we need to focus on that. Uh, they have a different set of values and concerns. I think they're a lot more balanced than we were or are. Sounds like it could well be. Hi, Dr. Roadcap. Good evening, Tim. Hey, Doug.
Well, good evening. It's a little past seven, so I'm going to go ahead and get the program underway, and uh, others will log on as the as the evening progresses. Um, well, good evening. I'm Richard Broadcap, program chair for the AADEJ, and I'd like to welcome all of our attendees tonight, and thank you for taking time out of your Friday night during the holiday season. In just a moment, I'll introduce our presenters, but, but first some housekeeping. There will be time for questions and discussion after all three speakers have finished, so please hold your questions until the end of the program. Discussion may involve more than one presenter. Please use the raised hand symbol at the bottom of your screen and I will recognize questions. Also, introduce yourself to the audience and mention your publication or association if possible. I'd like to especially thank Suzanne Pittman and staff of the American College of Dentists for their assistance in making tonight's program possible. If you need CE credit, information will be available at the end of the program. Our first speaker tonight is Tim Basilakos, who is the Senior Director of Strategic Business Operations for the Strategic Business Group at Henry Schein with the responsibility for the company's corporate social media team. The team is responsible for integrating and growing social media presences across the company's business groups, which speak to dental and medical professionals around the world. He holds an undergraduate degree in communications and public relations from the State University of New York at Oneonta. Tim, I hope I said that right. And a master's degree in media management from the new school. Our second uh, presenter tonight is, is Dr. Nathaniel Lawson. Dr. Lawson holds a uh, DMD and a PhD degree, and he's director of the Division of Biomaterials at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And for those of you not from the South, that's Birmingham and not Tuscaloosa. Um, University of Alabama School of, at Birmingham School of Dentistry, and he's the program director of the Biomaterials Residency Program. He graduated from UAB School of Dentistry in 2011 and obtained his PhD in biomedical engineering in 2012. He has served as an investigator on over 50 clinical and laboratory research grants and published over 150 peer-reviewed articles, books, chapters, and research abstracts. His research interests are the mechanical, optical, and biologic properties of dental materials, the subject near and dear to practicing dentist and clinical evaluation of new dental materials. He was the 2016 recipient of the Stanford New Investigator Award and the 2017 3M Innovative Research Fellowship, both from the ADA. He serves on the ADA Council on Scientific Affairs and is on the editorial board of the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry and Compendium. He has lectured nationally and internationally on the subject of dental materials. He also works as a general dentist in the UAB faculty practice. In rounding out our stellar lineup tonight is Teresa Pablos, who is a digital first producer and editor with nearly 10 years of experience creating multimedia content. She is a trained broadcast and digital journalist and currently serves as the editor in chief of the daily, and yes, you heard me right, daily, dental news website, drbicuspid.com. In her current role, Teresa edits features, curates thought leadership pieces, and produces video comment. She also is the host of Dr. Bicuspid's popular video series, Dental Dose. Now, if there are no further questions, I will turn the program over to Tim Basilakos. Thank you, Tim. I believe you're muted.
Suzanne, can you hear? Can you hear? Can you? Hi, everyone. I hope all is well. My name is Tim Vasilakos from Henry Schein. I am the Senior Director of Global Business Operations for Henry Schein Dental. And I'm pleased to join you here today. I really wish that we were live in person. God willing, we could be that way next year. I know we said that last year. Uh, hopefully this is the last time we're actually saying that. Um, we'd love to start off by thanking Dr. Chambers, Brian Shu, and of course my uh, my wonderful colleague and partner in crime over here at Henry Schein, uh, Miss Henry Gothard. Just a fantastic person and a, and a fantastic group of people that I've worked with um, over here between this presentation and last year. Uh, last year, I, was, I had the privilege of joining uh, the AADJ to present um, an intro to, to the topic of building out your social community on social media. Would love to expand on that a little bit, Dave. Uh, probably more a little bit more of an update. Um, what I what I do miss is having the back and forth, both both of being in person, being able to talk to each and every one of you um, as we go back and forth throughout the presentation or before and after the presentation, certainly miss that. So what I would love to do is just make sure that I extend an offer to reach out to me at any time uh, after this, um, virtually shoot me a team message, Zoom, however you wanna do it. I, I'm totally open to talking to anyone about and, and expanding on the topics that I'm gonna go through here today. Um, so with that today, we're gonna go through uh, what, what we titled building your social community, which is really finding, building, growing your community that fits the needs that's right for you. And I can't I can't emphasize that enough that each community needs to be different. We at Henry Shine have multiple, multiple uh, different types of social communities across the globe. You know, working in, in more than 30 countries, it really is important that we speak to the local market and we don't treat every customer like they're the same, whether they're a doctor, whether they're a dentist, or the various uh, professions that fall within those professions. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. It's just a little bit awkward not to have um, someone directly to talk to. So bear with me. Um, all right, I think that should be sharing. And then let me just go through where the social landscape is today. I know a lot of people see this. Um, it's it's um, probably not too surprising to see what is where and what's growing. Um, I, I would like to start by saying, you know, Facebook is still very much the dominant source uh, for social media across the globe. It, it still is very, very sticky with a lot of people. For someone like me, um, Facebook is something that I picked up freshman year of college and it's kind of been my home base for social media for almost uh, going close to 20 years. It's kind of, kind of scary to say that. Um, but it really is affecting uh, just so many people across the across the um, entire world, where um, almost seventy percent of internet using adults use Facebook. So keep keep in mind, basically, you know, a vast majority of the world uses the internet, and, and almost three quarters of those people have Facebook in some way, shape, or form. So if you're ever questioning yourself, hey, you know, is Facebook a place where my customers, my constituents, my readers are? The answer is likely yes. But the answer has likely changed over the last couple of years as to how you would use it. Um, when you go to Twitter, um, I think Twitter is probably the perfect demographic for this group here, right? A lot of people, key opinion leaders, uh, people in the media, that's where we really see it gravitating to. I'll tell you one thing, it's not. Twitter is really not the place for the individual dental practitioner. Uh, we do not see a lot of our individual customers on Twitter. Or if they do, they're not public about being a dentist, or they're not using it in any dental capacity. So I would, if you're if you're thinking about Twitter and what's right for you, I would keep in mind that it's certainly a lot more popular for media KOLs rather than what you would consider, you know, your private practice, even your DSO doc. It's going to be just so differently used. Um, not really a place where they come for peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Um, LinkedIn, obviously a little bit more of a professional skew here. A lot of people here, it, it, it has to do with their career, their career direct trajectory. We do see more and more dentists using it and, and dental professionals using it, which is really encouraging because we as a company have been using it. And it's honestly, from a Henry Schein standpoint, one of our biggest uh, platforms. Uh, you know, we're a company of about 20,000 uh, Team Shine members. Our LinkedIn following has well over 100,000 followers. So it shows you that there is impact there from both the uh, Team Shine member side, but also from the customer side. YouTube, if I were to be surprised about one thing on YouTube, it's that it's only 
if 81 of uh, adults use this, right? I, I, I keep finding myself um, YouTubing a question almost more than Googling a question. Uh, sometimes I, I don't even want to read something. I just want to be shown, hey, I, you know, how do I fix this patch of my grass? How do I do this in my house? It, it's it's incredible. And if you do the same thing with dentistry, you find it. You find people asking questions. Hey, how do I, how do I do this? How do I do that? It's it's uh, pretty incredible how much that has grown over the last couple of years. Then heading to the right side of this uh, graph, uh, there shouldn't be all too many surprises, right? Instagram, Snapchat, we kind of pair them together because the demographics are incredibly similar here, especially for new users. Um, a lot of increase in adult users, but obviously very, very popular with 30 and under, of which uh, I am a club that I'm, I, I have actually long gone now. But my sister um, is still in it just, just barely. And uh, I, I could tell you, very, very much still uh, the, the go-to place for what I would say the younger millennials, maybe the older Gen Zs. Um, I, I actually think 59% of users logging in daily seems very low, but according to Pew, that's where we're at. Um, and, and I would say a lot of our efforts in terms of targeting, targeting dentists, speaking to dentists, especially the next gen, you know, gen, gen Y, Gen Z, Instagram has taken over our priority. Um, it's just where they're all, all going to share their conversations. Um, I know that there's going to be a track about Instagram specifically, so I'll leave it to that. I'll, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we do, um, but I hope you take more fr from that session. Um, and again, if there's anything I could tie back or, or work in and, and follow up, please reach out to me. Um, Pinterest is something we use uh, very, uh, I would say, almost surgically. We use it for very specific reasons. Um, it has a very specific data, uh, a very specific following, right? Um, very, very um, female heavy. It is, um, it, it's something that I've realized uh, all my female friends use um, for one way or another. We, it's almost the same for dentists, right? Uh, we find that it's a lot of female dentists sharing inspirations, talking about different things that are going on, but it's very design focused. It's very inspirational. How are you setting up offices? How are you doing this and that? That's very aesthetic. Um, less so of, you know, peer reviewed things and best practices. Very interesting, though. If you, you could go down a rabbit hole there, spend some time, see what different offices are doing. It is it is really interesting, and we've used it for specific reasons, most notably our design services. And TikTok is something that we haven't uh, dived into yet as a company, um, mostly because our voice wouldn't particularly fit with the content that needs to be created, right? Um, it's a lot more about people-to-people -people communication rather than brand speaking. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't just try to cram a message on a different platform for the sake of doing it. That's not to say that we're not focused on it. We're totally listening, hearing what people are saying, whether it's about Shine, whether it's about the industry on the platform, but we're not, um, we're not actively marketing on it just yet. Maybe next year we talk about this as a completely different subject because that, that, that may have changed, but as of today, um, we, are not, we are not there yet. And then thinking about the community as we break into content creation, I, I, you know, one way that we would think, hey, here's how you should go about it is, um, we're we're very much focused on not doing everything just to say we're doing it, right? We're not on every platform just because we want to say, hey, Shine has a presence here and there. We want to be on the platforms that's right for our customers and for our Team Shine members. So the first thing we're always doing is defining our goals before ever creating any type of community, any type of social media content. And the next is defining your audience, right? Is your audience that you're trying to speak to actually on this platform? Do some due diligence. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but you wanna make sure that the people you wanna speak to are actually on the platform before you start spending time and resources uh, building it out. And then determining what type of content um, you're gonna create, right? You, If you're gonna go on Facebook, you're probably gonna create different content than you would if you went on Snapchat. Actually, you would 100% have to do that because the content isn't the same. Um, and then lastly is creating the content, creating a calendar for it, and then making sure that you have consistent use, which we're gonna go into even more. But honestly, when we were approached by many of our internal business groups at Shine about creating new social media pages, so new social media handles, we always have uh, stipulations as to what they need to follow, making sure that it is, wasn't just a, you know, an, an idea they had that they wanna start and walk away from. It needs to be a well thought out strategic process. And we wanna make sure that we're not just standing up brand pages, communities, just to, for the sake of doing it. 
And then for you guys, this should there shouldn't be any um, surprise here, right? Tomorrow's dentist, actually, I would say today's dentist, digital natives. If you take a look at the um, handful of the uh, current and pre immediate previous uh, as the presidents of who we all have really great relationships. I mean, just some fine fine people on this page, uh, Dr. Tanya Sue Maestas, Dr. Sohag Solomon, and Dr. Craig McKenzie. All people that we've worked with in the past, uh, we've actually had uh, what we call shine chat discussion between all of them and, and our uh, chairman and CEO, Stan Bergman. Uh, they all are incredibly sharing on social media. I mean, they share every aspect of their life and every aspect, certainly, of their dental professional there. And it's great to watch. It's great to see uh, see how they matured, how, how their journey has expanded over the last couple of years. Um, but it's indicative of the fact that our, our dentists today, our dentists of tomorrow's especially, they're going to talk about everything they're doing inside and outside of the office online, uh, For I would say from, from at least a vast majority part. So in terms of knowledge, um, please feel free to follow these young individuals and, and see what they're talking about, what's important to them. But it's easy to go in, you know, take a look at some of the hashtags they're, they're following and the hashtags they're using, dive into those conversations, really get an understanding of what these people are talking about. This will help you build out your community. It certainly is worth the time to do the due diligence and see, hey, what's, you know, what are dentists of today and tomorrow talking about before you dive in and say, here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, these three individuals I can't speak highly enough for, just great people. So when we dive into some of the things that we do at Shine and we talk about hey, we want to keep an engaged audience, stemming from the work that we've done with ASDA, the work that we do with some of our newer dentists, you know, we thought, and these are just examples that I'm going to show you, certainly not um, our whole strategic plan, but we think about, hey, you know, we want to make sure that we're relatable to them. We want to make sure that we're not speaking to them as a Fortune 300 company to a solo dentist. How could we get them engaged? And building out the relationships with them, making sure that we're able to create content that speaks to them and speaks to the peers is really fun. Um, now, this is one uh, a, a, a line of content that I will give full credit to uh, Miss Jessica Post on our team. She has been really active in working with our dental students um, and increasing engagement with them. And one way that she's done it is being sharing their best practices, working with them, talking to them on social to reshare some of the things that they're doing, some of the things that they're excited about, giving them a platform to a Fortune 300 company to speak to other dentists and, and doctors across the world to say, hey, you know, tell us your stories. We'll we'll help you tell them to others. And obviously, they they love that the feeling of being approached by you know such a large company, but also giving the platform to to expand their own reach. Just a couple of these posts that we've have are, are just dentists sharing you know milestones, things, uh, some of the uh, advice, the things that they would give to themselves in the past. Um, it really, really incredible. And you see here that it's as simple as working with them, reposting some of their own content where we've had huge spikes in engagement rates because people love to see what other people have to say. And especially young dentists with other young dentists when they're talking about, hey, listen, I'm just getting out of school. How do I do X, Y, and Z? They certainly love to see what other peers are doing. Um, so certainly an opportunity you have here. Um, and there's no shortage, no shortage of uh, content out there, especially with our with our new generation of dentists. Um, and then another thing we've been doing um, to boost the student engagement is um, using Reels. And this is something that didn't exist when we talked last year, but Reels is essentially, I mean, for lack of a better term, Reels is uh, Instagram's foray into doing what TikTok does, right? So short videos, fast, fast paced videos, moving quick, also very easy to consume and scroll on with your life. Um, we've created something that is a post we've been loving. It comes out every Friday, of which we share a, a bunch of reels and other posts across Instagram of things that we've been tagged in as a company. And very often, more often than not, it's tag, we're tagged in by dental students or, or young dentists, young, uh, young practitioners, and we reuse it. We create this uh, story at the end of the week and it's a really fun roundup of things that were talked about across the dental profession from people that follow us and people that thought to tag us. So really simple ideas. And like I said, happy to ideate some more with you if you if you ever have, want to reach out. Um, just some of the easy things that we've been doing to keep um, to keep a, a relevant conversation going. And then something we're doing from the business 
is, um, and I'm just messing with the animations, something we've been doing in the business is um, it, there's a lot of polls and a lot of ways that you could use um, multiple choice answers, uh, yes and no answers, voting, where we've talked about room design and how we could build it out. What, we, what you see here are different stories of the way people could build out a different room on social media. And what we do is we let the audience decide, right? We let the audience decide, hey, wh what do you want this room to actually look like? And after a day, we let the results come in and we show, hey, here's what as a collective of, your, of our audience, here's what you actually designed. It creates a fun stickiness for people because they feel like they have a little bit skin in the game, but it makes it so it's, 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 it's interactive with the brand, right? It's not just us talking to you. We want to hear back from you. And it doesn't need to be in such corporate jargony. It doesn't need to be such a, uh, you know, in, in this um, large space. It really is about, hey, you know, we're, we're curious about what you have to think about different designs, different things that are going on in the industry. We'd love to have your input. And it's as simple as taking their input and, and creating it on our end. Now, there's many ways you could take with this. I follow tons of brands that do something similar to this. Um, and maybe I'll be touched upon later. But there's no shortage of things you could do here. And then speaking of listening, um, I, I think this is really important, especially as you build out your community. Um, and that is, you know, think about social media listening and monitoring um, as something that is incredibly critical to the way you're going to build things out. Without it, you shouldn't even be doing it, right? So if you're listening, you want to be able to listen to all the things that your audience or your potential audience are saying that's going to really help you create your content moving forward. Um, if you're not doing that, then you're really just talking to yourself and hoping someone cares about what you have to say. At, at Shine, we don't post, unless it's something directly related to a sale or of a product or service, everything, every piece of content we build up is based off of previous data that we have of, of other engagement, right? So we're not just creating things hoping, hey, I really like this, Tim. You know, me as Tim, I think this is a great idea. Just go out and do it. We're looking at the data of what's worked in the past and we're building it for the future. Now, obviously, for uh, a company our size, our listening and monitoring also ties into many other things, right? Legal aspects, uh, HR aspects, Team Shine member issues. There's so much that are said about our brand that we need to, and obviously, we need to protect it. You might not have that level of issue, right? There's not that might not be something you need to worry about every day. But from a standpoint of if you're going to build a community, you certainly better be ready to listen to what the people who join it have to say, because if not, then you're talking to yourself. And with that, um, there are a handful of um, there are a handful of platforms I certainly could recommend. I swear, I work for neither of these platforms. I've used probably close to three digits of social media platforms over my um, 13, 14 years of doing this. And that is um, Hootsuite. It's really good for small to medium businesses, and Sprout Social also good for small, but they also do enterprise. Um, I would say. If you were just getting into things, Hootsuite should probably be the, the first go-to. It's really, really easy to use. Sprout probably has a little bit more features um, and might also cost a little bit more. But I recommend you ch checking out both. They also do a lot more than listening and monitoring. They do publishing. They do. Uh, you could do community management in there. No shortage of things you could do in there. Certainly um, employ you to spend some time in there um, before you think about putting together a social media strategy. And just the an idea of what this actually looks like, um, you know, we we log into our dashboard every day, and we have hundreds of things being said about the company, of which we need to make a decision: Are we going to reply to this? Are we going to follow up on this? How are we going to do it? I think everyone in this room can imagine that um, March to June, July of 2020, this these mentions were a mess in terms of, hey, what's going on with dentistry? What's going on with PPE? What's going on with products and services? Uh, I would say last year was probably one of the most challenging years in regard to social media management I've ever seen. Um, but the team did an awesome job at following up with every customer, every every comment, every question made, um, made for early mornings and long nights, but it certainly was a learning experience. And I think we're all a little bit better for it. But this is what I tell you when I say listening and monitoring is incredibly important. And if you stand up some social media pages, you better be prepared to answer some questions. You better be prepared to take the feedback because if not, then you're not doing it for any particular reason that's that's beneficial to your followers, to your audience, to your readers. And one thing that I wanted to mention regarding um, the communities you, you are thinking about, I, I know there's a lot of ways you guys could build things out. Um, 
one way that might be most beneficial for for you is building out private groups and private groups has many definitions you can make a private so it's private completely nobody can know about it unless you send them a link you can make it so it's private where someone could see it but they have to ask permission to join and you can make it public so anyone could join anyone could see anything there's many options there and like i said easy to find out exactly the details here or please reach out to me but for for you especially if you're building out smaller niche groups private groups are certainly facebook's um, focus the last couple of years they find that it keeps people on the platform because it talks to it brings people of like natures together it keeps uh it keeps people within pockets where you know, people can help each other out. And in dentistry, there's no shortage of them. I mean, there are so many dental Facebook groups, um, many, many popular, many that have thousands, if not tens of thousands of followings, um, where you could really build out your niche topics, talk about specific issues. It really is a place that is booming. Certainly something that we from Henry Shine try to be involved with, but from an arm's distance, right? Because we're not, we're not an authority. We're certainly not clinical. And we want to make sure that we're respectful of everything that um, that the practitioners have to say, so we do we do pay attention to what's being said as long as it's public enough or that someone's in, someone's in the group and we can actually see it. But for you guys especially, it's a little bit different. You have a unique opportunity right now to build out private uh, to build out a group that could speak to your niche following, to speak to your niche needs. Um, and I, I won't say I'm a little jealous that you have that because we we don't right and. And you, you guys will have, you know, a, a strong following that could probably grow quite quickly, um, especially if you're talking about your readership, your viewership. So please keep that in mind. And then I certainly want to talk about when you're talking about building out your community, how are you measuring success? Um, I'll tell you, there's no shortage of data points that you'll have when you start digging into uh, social media metrics, so much so that it's it just incredibly confusing. You could get so into the weeds, so much so that you don't even know what you're looking at anymore. And, and man, when you get into social media advertising, there are so many metrics that you could have that it's a little uh, mind blowing. With that in mind, I would encourage that you don't get too enamored with followership, right? Um, you, everyone wants a big audience, but I, I will tell you there are pros and cons of having a big audience. Um, the biggest con being the larger audience you have, the less likely more people are to see your content. And I know that sounds confusing because you would think larger audience means I'm going to have more people to see than my content. But the way that Facebook and Instagram's algorithm and maybe even LinkedIn and Twitter work is the more people you have, following your page, the more they throttle down your reach organically. And what I mean by organically is unpaid when you're not paying to reach them. Whole nother topic that I could spend another a couple of hours on. I know it's a little confusing, but what I, what I mean by all of this is if you could focus on your engagement rate, and that includes when people comment, like, share on, your, uh, on the pieces of content you, that you uh, publish, this is what really matters, right? Because this is what people see, at, or this is what the platform see as, hey, people care about what you have to say. So we're going to keep showing them what you have to say. If you keep seeing that your content falls flat, it's not working out, people, people who follow you are not engaged with it. This is really where I'm talking about. You need to listen to the data and move on, right? You need to follow, you need to find what your audience actually cares about. Engagement rate is probably the best indicator of that. Um, and it's not as black and white as that in terms of saying, oh, we just need to do X and Y will happen. But it's certainly something you want to put at the top of your strategy. If you're putting out content that no one's caring about, in, in all honesty, it's the same thing as publishing a newspaper 30 years ago and, and no one buying it and reading it, right? So you have to be, you kind of have to have uh, a little thick skin when it comes to this because you might have something you think is great and you find out completely falls flat on social, but you have to be able to roll with it and keep going. There have been countless ideas that the team has come up with uh, based off of data. Hey, we think this is going to work over the years and it's completely fall flat. And guess what? We just got to keep moving on. We'll try something else. We'll try something new. We'll listen to the data. We'll listen to the audience and we'll, we'll try something new next week. So don't be afraid of moving on from something, um, especially the faster you could do it, the better for your morale. And just so you know, um, when you think of engagement rate, um, it, it's not as easy as, oh, I have 100 followers. Uh, I had one 
click of something. I had one like of something. I have a one percent engagement rate. Um, it's a little more complex than that, um, but not all too much. It, the way you make engagement rate, and this is based off of the how platforms define it. It's total engagements divided by impressions times 100, and that gives you an engagement rate. So you'll see that fluctuate up and down. Um, even across our company, we have it fluctuating up and down, but we have very different audiences, right? Across China as a whole, we have so many uh, professions within dentistry, uh, medicine. It's just so many different types of roles within that that we're trying to speak to. We see engagements rates spike up and down, very dependent on that. Which, which means you really should fo focus on the quality of things and not the quantity of things. I know I know this is almost cliche to say, but um, a lot of people ask, hey, you know, how many times should I post a week? How many times should I post a month? How do I create a calendar? There is no right answer there, right? If you go and look at a newspaper on Facebook or Instagram, they're posting multiple times a day because guess what? That works for them. If you look at Shine, if you look at Henry Shine Dental, we probably post three to four times a week because that's kind of what works for us right now, right? We, we have to find out what works for us. There is no right answer to say, hey, how many times should I post a week? It, there, is, there just isn't. You need to find the cadence that's right for you, but also what's realistic in terms of content that you're going to create, right? So tell me how many great pieces of content you think you could create and what the cadence is of that. And if that's once a, once a week, once a month, it's better than cramming three things on one week and then not doing anything for another four to six weeks. So it's really important that you have this build out phase where you talk about how am I going to create a line of quality content rather than say, hey, I have two great things I really want to get out right now. Uh, we'll worry about everything else later because that's when everything falls apart, when you have to live day by day. So if we're thinking about the importance of consistent use, you know, number one is always keeping your followers engaged. Like I said, if they're not engaged, they're just not going to see your content anymore. So if I, if I scrolled on and I saw something from Nike and I didn't even stop to read it, I certainly didn't like it, I didn't click on it, Facebook's going to think, you know what, Tim really doesn't care what Nike has to say. So let's stop serving him it. Let's, even though he follows Nike, let's stop showing him the content. And Facebook takes more than just likes, clicks, and, 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 um, and shares. They'll know when someone stopped to read the actual posts. So keep that in mind, right? If you're not engaging your followers, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, they're going to know about it and they're going to stop showing your followers your content. Um, so keep that in mind, especially as you try things if they're not working. Um, making, social media, making social media part of your everyday activities, incredibly important. What we see all, all too often is people do a whole bunch of activity and then they say, okay, throw this up on social media. That's just not how it works, right? If you're not thinking about how am I going to use this on social media from, the, from its origins, you're going to end up throwing things that don't belong on social media on social media. And that's where you see things really crash and burn. And then lastly on this, consider who your, cust who your customer is, or in this instance, your reader, your viewer, and what they want to see. Um, you have to be really unselfish here. Think about, I mean, the way I look at it, I'm, I'm not a dentist. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a dental professional. I am always looking at things the way that I think our customer sees it, not the way that I see it, because I for certain do not consider myself an authority especially on the clinical side. So I'm constantly looking at data, constantly looking at what they're doing on social. Like I said, look up those hashtags, look up those influencers, see what they're talking about. Easy way to tap in there. And then we don't have time to talk through all the aspects of paid social media, but I definitely wanted to talk through a couple. Um, and again, another thing, please, if you have questions on paid social media advertising, I'm more than happy to spend time with you maybe even meet with a team to talk about how this works, how we do it, some best practices you could take. But some of the things that you're gonna be looking at if you, if and when you get into paid social media, um, we wanted to highlight the three most important um, aspects. So this is when you're paying to reach people when you're buying advertising rates, or when you're buying advertising media. One is a click-through rate, right? Obviously, this means how many people saw it versus how many people actually thought that to click through it. This is one of the ways that the social platform is going to charge you. Um, one of the most basic ways they charge you is cost per click, right? So you say to Facebook, hey, I'm willing to pay a dollar for someone to click this article, or hey, I'm, I'm willing to pay up to $10 for someone to click on this or do this. This is a very basic way that they charge you. And obviously, that could fluctuate a ton. You can make it so hey, I'm willing to pay a couple cents for someone to read this and see this. Just wanted to get you familiar with how this all works. And then one of the most mainstay pieces of data, um, this is, you know, 
lived for for decades is a uh, CPM. CPM is cost per how many uh, thousands of people who have seen the piece of content you post. One of the options you could have is, hey, I'm going to run a post. It's going to be about this. I don't really care if the person clicks it or not. I just really want them to see it. You could pay for them. To, you could pay per thousand people. So that's the that's the amount that Facebook, Instagram will charge you to reach 1,000 people. Um, three. These are just three of the basic ways that they charge you. There are many, I mean, dozens, if not potentially hundreds of ways you could create a campaign and how you want to pay for it. These are three of the most basic ways. Honestly, uh, one of the most ways we've done things for years is cost per click because it, usually we want to get someone from A to B. So it's getting them off of Facebook to a platform, whether it's to read something, whether it's to buy something. Um, there's also cost per lead. There's just so many things we could talk about. So like I said, can't spend too much time on it right now, but feel free to reach out. Um, I, I, I did want to go into this because this will probably go into how you guys go about um, building out your communities and how, especially if you get into advertising, um, how, how that works. You know, one of the things we hear often is, is Facebook listening to us? Is, is my cell phone transmitting what we're actually saying? I will say there's tons of times where it certainly feels that way. Do I personally believe it? I'd say no, because we reveal more to Facebook and Facebook's partners by typing things out than we'll ever say out loud. So I'll give you an instance. Um, we ha I had with my colleague, uh, Joe, who, who is actually helping me run this video, is um, a couple of months ago, actually it was pre-pandemic, so maybe let's say two years ago. Two years ago, uh, we were talking in the hallway at Henry Schein, and we and he had come over to me and he said his, his wife had just become a realtor on Long Island. And he had said to me, hey, you know, when we have time, we'd love to talk to Mari, his wife, about uh, doing social media for, for her realty business. So of course, you know, let's we could, you know, next time we have dinner, lunch, whatever, we'll certainly go over it. I could try to help her best I can from a small business aspect. Lo and behold, it was like 15 minutes later. I get back to my office and I get an advertisement for uh, a social media expert for realtors right on my Facebook timeline. Send me a screenshot. Um, I said, how creepy is this? Right. Now, granted, to anyone that isn't on the back end of social media ads all day, like uh, myself and my team sometimes, you would think, okay, Facebook clearly heard that, right? They, they thought, let's serve Tim with a, a realtor ad because he talked about uh, being a realtor. So we think he is one. What likely happened, more, more unless this is disproven re regarding how Facebook listens, is Facebook, I have GPS on, on my Facebook, right? Joe does on his Facebook. Joe, Facebook knew that Joe and I were together. Facebook knows that Joe is married to Madi. Facebook knows that Madi is a realtor. Facebook could assume that Madi was looking at things for social media on realtor, that Joe knew about it and Joe was with me. So what were we talking about, right? These are the assumptions and there's thousands in your life that Facebook will take based off of knowing your GPS, based off of knowing what you do for a living, based off of you know thousands of websites they know that you visit because Facebook is partners with them. Now the next slide that I'm going to show you might be uh, might be a little surprising, and I and I do uh, I do uh, I'll encourage everyone on this call to go uh, to go take a look at what I'm talking about, and that is if it, if we were live, I would ask you, hey, do you know what I'm looking at? So I'll ask, do you know what I'm looking at? I'll take a fake pause and I'll tell you, and that is what I'm looking at right now is one page of 150 pages that Facebook has on me personally, knowing what I'm interested in, knowing in websites that I've visited, knowing in things that I've showed interest that I bought in the past. And it's really, really, you know, kind of creepy because they it just shows you Facebook's breadth in terms of how deep they can look into what you're personally interested in. Now, all these things within the last, I'd say some are a little dated, within the last couple of years are things I've absolutely done recently bought a house, so I've been on Zillow a ton. Obviously, between ADA, dentistry, all these dental things make sense, right? I'm constantly on dental websites. HubSpot, I mean, I brought up to, I brought up HubSpot like, what, five slides ago? Uh, Etsy, I bought a ton there. We were planning a wedding a couple of years ago, so we spent a ton of time on Etsy. Save the elephants. Uh, my wife and I actually adopted two elephants. It's all these things. And now imagine, they had 150 pages of this on me. 
So obviously not, not all is correct, right? I'm not a physician assistant and I don't even have Bank of America. So I don't know why that's on there, but it tells you the trail of breadcrumbs that you leave, Facebook is able to see. It's certainly gotten tighter over the last year or two with all these privacy concerns popping up. But the way that, um, and there's actually one big one, and that is um, the way that Apple and Facebook have uh, started to kind of butt heads has definitely um, impacted this. So maybe next year we'll have an updated presentation on this and how this all works. But Facebook really knows, and Facebook, Instagram, and even other platforms really know what you're interested in because you surf the web while you're while you're logged in on Facebook. So they they know all the partner websites they visited, and that's why you start seeing advertisements for things that are relative to your interests. Um, so keep that in mind. I mean, listen, for for our personal side, could totally seem creepy, could, could totally seem invasive, and it, this could be shocking to a lot of people. But from a business side, this does tell you the power that social media advertising will have for you, especially as you build out your communities, especially if you run any advertisements. There's no shortage of ways that you could try to target your, your readers, your viewers, your constituencies. And then the last thing I really want to leave you with um, is thinking of social media as a business sense. Um, it might not be relevant for every single person on this call, but I want you to know how Henry Schein and most businesses, certainly the businesses that I've worked for, have thought of, of social media. It is unlikely that social media will be will often be the last touch you have before a purchase, right? If you saw a car commercial on social media, it's unlikely right there and then you decide I'm buying that car. Similar to a house, similar to a box of gloves. It's just not, you, you don't really go from seeing what your friends and family are doing to uh, making major purchases in one step. So if you look at the sales funnel and how we approach it, this it, social really gravitates towards the top. When you think of a display ads, you know, display ads are those things that you see on websites, those banners, different things, very much awareness, less about purchase intent. You go down, you go down to SEO. By the time you get to SEO, this is where you're thinking of buying things. So you're Googling it, right? So that, that's what SEO is and, and paid search, especially. You get lower, you get to email, you get to that paid search part. That's where you're talking about running Google ads for people that are, have shown intent about buying something, right? So if I say, I wanna buy a new laptop and I go in and I put Toshiba laptop into Facebook into a Google, that's a, a paid search ad will fi probably find me and say, hey, Tim's really interested in buying a Toshiba laptop because that's pretty specific and he typed in the model and he typed in the price that he wants to pay. So let's serve him a paid ad, right? Total opposite from you casually scrolling Instagram and Facebook, wondering what you know your old roommate's doing and then all, all of a sudden being served with a, an advertisement or a piece of content from Henry Schein. The psychology there is just completely different, which is why I wanted to paint the picture of what this looks like in terms of the sales funnel. It's important to keep this in mind, especially when building out your goals for social media. You Social media goals should not be crammed at the bottom. Sure, there are certain things on social media that could lead to purchases, that could lead to um, you know sales, but it's certainly more often than not a place for consideration and awareness. So with that, I wanna thank you. I really appreciate the time that you've offered me. I appreciate being asked to come back again. I'm, again, sorry we can't be in person. Hopefully one day we can. I would love to meet all of you. Um, certainly uh, certainly a um, welcome all of your questions, concerns, anything. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about social media all day, every day. It is thoroughly interesting to me. Um, and if you have any problems, hey, I, I would love to help ideate how to get you through them because the industry is incredibly um, active on social media. We find new things every day and it certainly excites us. So with that, I will pass it off. I thank you again. Thank you so much for the time and please reach out to me if you need anything. I wonder, I, I know that, uh, that I, I'm maybe supposed to be giving the next presentation. Is there, 
Uh, is there any segue? Okay, I guess you're, 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 just... you're up. You're up, Dr. Lawson. Okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, can you all see my presentation okay? Yes. Okay, so I have to admit this is a little bit of a surprise because I, I also had recorded my presentation and um, I thought I was just going to be playing the presentation. I had, we just had a daughter uh, to less than two weeks ago and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to come online and do this but uh, she's pretty good and my parents are here and they're watching her so uh, I guess this is this will work out um, so what I'm here to talk about is uh, maybe more specifically Instagram and maybe a little bit about Facebook too I was watching uh, Tim's presentation and I have to say that was really uh, really interesting for me to learn about you know, on a more professional level, how social media is done. So my name is Nate Lawson. I um, am a full-time academic. I'm uh, an associate professor at the School of Dentistry at University of Alabama at Birmingham. So I'm coming to you from, from my home here in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a, really what I do is I'm a, a biomaterialist. I, um, I I think Jack Farrakane is on here. So, uh, you know, he's, he's one of my big heroes um, professionally. And uh, I think he's one of the guys that helped wrote me into this conver conversation. Um, but, you know, something I've been doing uh, for fun over the past maybe three years is uh, being more involved with social media, both on Instagram and on Facebook. So what I intend to do uh, over this next little bit of time is talk to you about, um, you know, someone that's living in the social media world um, and it, uh, within dentistry and how you know, personally, I use the platform, maybe some ideas for how others uh, can use it within dentistry specifically. So this is my little back, my, my thing is, you know, why most social media, Instagram versus Facebook, how to increase followers. I have some stuff in here about photography. I'm probably just going to skip through it. I, I like photography and that's how I've, you know, made a lot of my Instagram content. And then I'll kind of end with, you know, my thoughts on how to create an engaging post. Again, Tim's was amazing. Tim, you can tell as a professional. I'm, a, you know, clearly an amateurist at this uh, social media stuff, but just to, you know, in case you're a uh, grassroots organization or grassroots effort on your social media and, and just see some, you know, less how a non-professional handles this, uh, this field, you, you can see what I'm kind of doing. So I'll tell you, like, you know, for me, so I think it's relevant to say so I'm 37. Um, and so Facebook came at Mark, I'm the same age as Mark Zuckerberg. So Facebook came out when I was in college. And, um, and then Instagram came out when I was a little, uh, I think I, right after I graduated dental school. And so I always thought Instagram was silly child's play. And um, one day I was, I had moved from Chicago and from uh, back down to Birmingham, um, where I'm living now. And when I was in Chicago, there's uh, I used to get my hair cut and they used to put a little, you can't see it now, but they put a little line in my haircut in my, in my side part. And uh, when I moved to Birmingham, I couldn't find anyone to do that. And my wife, I uh, was scrolling through Instagram and she said, oh, there's this lady at this hairdresser place and she, all the guys that she cuts their hair, they put the little side thing in there. And that was about six years ago. And I went to her as a hairdresser and I've been seeing her since. And that was like one of the first times like, oh my gosh, social, you know, Instagram is, uh, how would I have ever found that out just from Google? Like Instagram is more than just for kids. It's a, uh, you know, there's a real business opportunity here. And then, you know, and then I thought about this more, even, you know, uh, for like, you know, my wife and I, we're not quite foodies. I think that's a little aggressive for what you, we like to go to restaurants though. And, you know, this is one of our favorite restaurants in Birmingham. And one of our big things is, you know, we're always wondering are our restaurants that we like to go, are they going to be open on, um, you know, on the holidays or like we're Jewish. So I was wondering where can we go to get some food on Christmas? And so like we, uh, um, you know, either it's not always on the ego of Google, you type in the restaurant's name and it'll tell you it's hours and it said these hours might be affected by the holidays. Then you go on Instagram or Facebook and you look on their website and their, their page and they'll tell you, you know, their holiday hours. So, I mean, you know, that's the other neat thing about social media is it's, it's very current and it's, you know, it, it, it's more interactive than just a, a website. So, you know, some of these things are just how I personally realize, you know, Instagram and Facebook aren't just for kids. They're for, you know, they're for real business purposes and professional purposes. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, so I'm, I guess I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I guess I'm an old millennial. Uh, so I was born in 1984. Uh, and it's interesting. I was talking to my, um, 
my in-laws about, uh, you know, where we get our news from and, you know, everything that happened, you know, if it's the, the written house, uh, your verdict into the, uh, you know, the elections or it, I hate to know this, but every piece of information I get is from uh, Facebook or Instagram. Like I don't, I don't have, we don't have cable. So I don't, I don't watch the news. I don't go to CNN.com or foxnews.com or anything like that. Um, and whereas my parents have cable and, and my, my in-laws read the newspaper. Um, so, you know, in, um, like, you know, it's just a, 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 this is some statistics about how frequently people of different generations spend on their, on their social media accounts. So, um, you know, if I'm sitting here in this millennials, you know, two and a half hours, that sounds about right. <laughs> I hate to admit that, but that sounds about right. You know, I've got a brother who's even younger than me and yeah, about three hours sounds about right. Um, so it was a lot of time spent on these social media accounts. So when I think about social media within the space of dentistry, I think of different kinds of, uh, uses for social, social media. So we've got some that are, uh, clinical education. We've got, you know, like uh, this is a Facebook group called Dental Clinical Pearls, and they and they're providing clinical education for dentists and mentorship. We've got some that I consider just dental communities, like places that um, you know dentists can go to to talk about their problems and talk about you know staff and that kind of thing. Uh, we've got dentists that are using social media uh, for. Um, marketing, like more as a business sense. And then we've got the kind of, uh, this is my um, Instagram page. And we are, you know, kind of market ourselves like dental experts, like KOLs. And, and we use this platform kind of, you know, as, as, a, as an academic, I like to think of it, you know, we started it altruistically for teaching students and making it more engaging. And then I guess as time has gone on, it's also for, you know, uh, speaking opportunities and that kind of thing and engagement with, with, um, uh, you know, the uh, companies that we interact with. Uh, so, you know, and it, so in a, in a, in a, so this is like, you know, Tim presented a very, uh, a great, awesome uh, overview of how, I guess, corporates uh, is using uh, social media. This is more from like a, you know, an individual perspective of, of using social media. So, um, so these are all different sites created by individual dentists that, you know, for one for mentorship and clinical education, one for community, some using it for practice marketing and some of us using it for the dental expert or being part of this larger dental social media community. So again, clinical education, uh, you know, this has been a really great uh, tool. Uh, I remember when I graduated from dental school, uh, I worked in a DSO, I was a young dentist, I knew nothing. And there was three of us young dentists that all worked together and we all knew nothing. And we didn't have a great place for mentoring. We'd all ask each other and it was like the blind leading the blind. Uh, and, I mean, it's a little scary now you see some of the things that people post on, on these Facebook pages. Sometimes you wonder if they're validating HIPAA, but they'll say, I've got this patient who came in, they have this condition, what do you think I should do about it? And they'll get a bunch of um, you know, information and feedback from, from dentists. Uh, it's kind of like some group polling. You'll have a lot of times specialists weigh in and the specialists are weighing in, which is uh, nice. Uh, they're doing it sometimes for their own reasons because they're kind of advertising themselves is, you know, uh, you know, particularly in a big city, they'll say, uh, you know, here's the answer to this question. P.S. I live in, I take referrals and I practice in Houston or whatever. Um, there's dental communities. Uh, this one's called Dental Nachos. It's run by a guy named Paul Goodman. I don't know why he calls it Dental Nachos, but everything he does has some relation back to nachos, which is, I guess, funny. Um, but he, I think he actually does practice sales. And so that's why he st started this, but it's, it's, they don't talk as much about clinical dentistry. They talk more about, you know, how to deal with staff and how to deal with depression and burnout and, you know, um, and funny things in dentistry. Um, and it's just, dental community. And the last, these past two things I showed, both Dental Clinical Pearls and Dental Nachos are both closed Facebook groups where, you know, dentists can ask to become members. And as long as you're in the dental profession, you can join these cl closed Facebook groups. Um, then, you know, within the, um, there's practice marketing. So, um, you know, the, um, this is somebody just marketing his dental page and obviously using it to attract patients and also attracting referrals. I think it's funny too, to think about like the content obviously that you put into these pages can dictate uh, who you're trying to, to advertise to. And like, you know, if I'm, when I'm posting stuff on, in dentistry, you know, if I was going to post something in dental journal, I would show like a composite filling that I'm doing and I would show it 
close up, you know, all the gums, you know, full retraction, all the gums close up just that too. So you can see all the margins of the composite that I'm so proud of. And I'd be, and I could be, you know, posting that on Facebook and my wife would be sitting next to me and looking at me and she's not a dentist. She said, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Like, why would I want to see a tooth that close up? And she would like to see, you know, she was looking for a dentist. She'd want to see a dentist that posts pictures like this. And she said, Oh, look at her smiles are nice and bright and white. I don't want to go to that guy. Uh, you know, she doesn't want to see my perfect margins on my class four composite. I'm so proud of. Um, so, you know, you, you know, a lot of social media is like, who are you, who are you trying to, um, reach with your content? And then this is our, our Instagram, uh, page where, uh, you know, we're posting, you know, uh, pictures of, uh, content that's supposed to be for, for dentists specifically. So we'll show close-ups of teeth and things like this that patients would never want to see. Um, all right, a little bit about um, Instagram versus Facebook. Um, so just to give you a little bit of the, um, uh, when these things were created, like, so um, this was created when, I guess, in the, uh, in the middle when I was in college when Facebook came out and um, and then Twitter and I'm really glad Tim said you know I've never found a person I, I don't even have Twitter and I don't know that much of the dental community is on Twitter and then Instagram came out a little bit later and this is like you know everybody that I know is on on Facebook Instagram you know many uh, you know Tim Tim I think Tim and I are probably about the same age and he, he I guess, is not as active on Instagram. You know, it, it, it is true. Like it's a lot of 20 year olds, uh, a decent amount of 30 year olds. And then, you know, pl plus on, on Instagram now. And it's kind of uh, the newest thing is TikTok. And I'm glad Tim said that they're not going on that. Tim TikTok is a lot of just dancing people. And I, I never want to go on TikTok. And I hope that the dental community doesn't move to TikTok. Uh, but um, so I, in my mind, Facebook and Instagram right now are the two kind of platforms that I try to become a part of. And I'm just gonna skip through that slide. So, you know, the difference to me between um, Instagram and Facebook is Instagram is like a highly visual uh, platform. All it is, if, you, if you're not on Instagram, you haven't seen it before, you, you open it up and, you know, all you see is a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of just, pictures. And so, uh, you know, when you're making content for Instagram, you just want, you have to make highly engaging, um, highly engaging pictures. So let me see if I can. So, you know, it just looks something like this, it's just a, a screen full of a whole bunch of uh, pictures. And so it's, it's, it's image driven. Um, you know, it's also when you start off with a um, Instagram page, you know, there's no uh, groups or anything like that. You have to create your own individual Instagram page and you start off day one with zero followers. And so like now we've got something uh, almost 80,000 followers, but probably the first six months I was on Instagram, I remember having a big celebration. I think we'd been on for a year and we got 500 people to follow us. So you start off with a very, with nothing and you really have to um you really have to build it up i mean if you if you're a if you're a known name uh you know if you're a journal and you have a known name some people might follow you uh just because of the name of your journal but it's not going to be you know there's many big organizations that have very few uh, followers but the neat thing you know since you have your own page you you have some autonomy you you know you make your own page you make your own rules of who can post what and what you want to post on there and and you can and you can uh, gain followers by making good engaging content so that's how we were able to grow our page was by having you know working really hard and making interesting pictures that people wanted to uh, see and that's how we uh, grew our, our following so but with instagram it's, it's all about pictures and having engaging picture content and very few people actually read um, the text. And, and I'll be honest, uh, 80%, no, probably about 75% of our following is not from the United States of America. Uh, and so I don't know that they even read any of our text. Uh, so pictures are really big. Facebook is on the other hand, you know, Facebook, you know, uh, there's two ways you can think about using Facebook. You can make a business account or business page, kind of like your personal page, and you can post information on there. Uh, and then in that sense, it's a little bit like Instagram where you start off with nothing, but you know, when I, when I engage with dental social dental Facebook, I'm engaging with some of these closed groups. I think Tim was mentioning uh, closed groups on, on Facebook. They have closed groups like, um, dental clinical pearls or dental nachos, like I was showing you and, and to, to get uh, engagement, uh, which is a word I've, I've learned by becoming involved with social media, uh, 
which means likes and follows and comments, all that kind of stuff. You uh, don't have to have great pictures. You a lot of times on uh, on Facebook, and if you're participating in these closed dental groups, you can have engaging texts and tell stories, or you know, and, and you can post pictures too. But they don't always have to be the most uh, interesting photos. So you can get away with just having more uh, interesting uh, text. But when you participate in closed uh, dental Facebook groups, um, the dis I mean, the advantage is, you know, if you join Dental Clinical Pearls, they already have 50,000 followers. So I can post something on there and automatically um, there will be an audience. I mean, if my post is not very engaging, not all of those 50,000 people will see it. Probably, you know, a couple hundred will see it. And if I, you know, I posted things on there that over a thousand people have liked. So that means probably 10,000 people to 20,000 people saw that, that content. Um, but you have to play by the rules of the moderators that, that, that set up the, the closed group. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so a lot of times what I do with the closed Facebook groups is I would direct, I would post content on there and then direct people to other sources, like to my, um, to my website or to my Instagram uh, account. How to increase followers is a lot of times when people start an account, particularly on Instagram, um, you know, I've had friends start accounts. So how do we, how do we get people to follow our account? Cause we started it and we 20 people follow it and it's been a couple months. So um, really the only good answers that I know of is to create engaging content. Um, just to give you an idea of like how many people will follow a, a, an account. So, I mean, you know, th this is the upper echelon of like Kim Kardashian, the 20, 257 million, but you know, big, you know, there are things like the Chicago White Sox, it was my, uh, I know uh, Jack's on here and he's, I know he's a big Cubs fan, but I was grew up a big uh, White Sox fan and um, you know, the White Sox have 550,000. So that's, you know, they're a big, you know, uh, major league baseball team uh, and they have 550 just to give you an idea of how many people follow that. And then Ario Speedwagon, has about 50,000. <laughs> I just use them as an example of someone that's famous, but not relevant. Um, uh, so within dentistry, like the really big dentistry accounts on Instagram have about, you know, 500,000 followers, um, you know, five or, you know, a couple hundred thousand followers. If you look, uh, you know, there's dental influencers, um, individuals that will have like two, uh, you know, a couple, uh, you know, these are just another you know, these are maybe kind of, these are some of the big, big uh, accounts. These are some of the moderate size um, uh, dental influencer accounts. And if you look at companies, companies, you know, like I said, if you start off, even if you're, you know, 3M or even the American Dental Association has about 50,000 followers. So, uh, you know, the, the dental influencers, people in the dental community can have as many uh, followers as big, big accounts. I, I think I actually just looked up in, um, Shine maybe has about 20,000 followers. So, but it was really interesting to hear what Tim said is you don't have to, I never really realized that everyone was chasing this number of more and more and more and more followers. But honestly, and I've seen that before where people that have 10,000 followers get four or 5,000 people to like their photos, you know, where we have this, you know, uh, 80,000 followers and, you know, nobody ever likes more than one or two thousand people will like a photo, which means that maybe what, um, maybe a, a popular thing, maybe 60, 70,000 people will see a, a particular post that we put out. You can also get, you know, I see people do this as they buy followers, which is the worst thing to do. I think there's like robots in Russia that are just clicking on your pictures to like them and you pay money for it. And it's a terrible thing. And anybody that's uses social media will know there's accounts that you can, you can tell when people have bought followers um, because they'll have a really high number of followers, but nobody will like their pictures or they'll put out content that's terrible and a thousand people will like it. And then, you know, well, this is not a real account. So, you know, how, how do we grow our account? Um, one of the, the big ways to grow accounts is to find bigger accounts that will repost your content. Uh, so sometimes you have to pay for this, or sometimes if they like it, they will repost your content. Uh, so these are some big accounts. You can use hashtags. So, you know, until three years ago, I did not understand what the concept of a hashtag. Uh, I just thought it was a, a thing that hipster said, and I didn't, I didn't really understand it. But a hashtag is just a way to make some some text that you make either on Facebook or on Instagram, like searchable. So like if I make a post, I'll put hashtag dental, hashtag dentist, hashtag a couple other things at the end of my post. And that means that other people, other dentists that are out there um, that like content that has hashtag dental on it 
will also maybe be fed some of my content because Instagram will recognize that I'm making dental content and content for dentists. And it's a way to hopefully get spread out some of my content so other people will see it. And then of course you have to make engaging content and then also uh, Instagram rewards you for consistency. So like, I remember when we were posting a lot, um, our account got really, really hot and we would post a lot of content. We we're getting a lot of followers. And then I went on vacation for two, two weeks and didn't post anything. And then came back and posted why I thought it was a really great post and like five people liked it or something. So yeah, it, it does reward consistency. Um, uh, so yeah, so the difference between a hashtag and then the at sign, hashtags again, are, you use keywords so that people know that that's the, that's the type of content that you're posting so that hopefully Instagram feeds that content to other people interested in those hashtags. At signs means like, you know, you, if you tag at dental tube, when you post something, then I would see it. And then I might say, oh, that was an interesting thing. Let me repost that on my account and then tag your account so other people would see your content. Another great way, Tim, as Tim had mentioned, to get content out is to use uh, influencers, uh, you know, like dental students or people that are, you know, want to engage with your, um, you know, organization. Um, so like Figs is a scrubs company that has done this famously. I think they must give scrubs for free out to uh, certain people that want to um, be you know, Instagram influencers, and then they wear those scrubs and take a billion pictures with fig scrubs. And then now figs is, you know, the hottest scrub company, or, you know, you can allow, you know, the American Dental Association does this. They let as the, you know, repost something that as a post or something that their members post. And then that's, that's a way that, you know, to keep their, their followers engaged. Um, of course, you have to think about what kind of followers do you, uh, do you want? Uh, so like, you know, if you want to have international followers, um, one thing I've learned for our account, we got a lot of international followers. So we have a lot of pictures and there's not a lot of text on them so that you don't have to understand English to follow our account. Um, again, if you want to think about who are you trying to target? Is it, is it, uh, patients or dental professionals? Like I mentioned the story earlier, like, you know, if I'm trying to target a, um, a, a, a patient, I wouldn't show like a close up of a, of an implant surgery because they're going to, they're never going to want to go to your practice. They're going to probably, you know, uh, uh, it's, it might be shocking and terrifying to them to see that. Um, and then, you know, dentist, students, hygienists, technicians, industries, the like, you know, with students sometimes, you know, if I'm trying, you know, our account kind of lies in that, you know, we try to be kind of funny and, hip and relevant a little bit to kind of, you know, cause we're in an academic teaching institute. So trying to be relevant with students, um, but might interact differently depending on, you know, who, you, which, what type of, um, you know, who you're going after with your, with your content. Um, just a little bit in, and Tim did a really nice job of this. So I, I, it might not be as relevant, but just a little bit, you know, I remember again, I, Three years ago, I got on Instagram. I had never, I had no idea what was going on. I had my little brother sit there and start the count with me and show me how to press all the buttons. And it took me like the first three months to figure out what all the little buttons did and what you could do with this thing. And then they kept on changing it every time. And they still change it every once in a while. And I can't figure out what the buttons do. But, um, you know, if I open up my, my, Instagram account, it looks just like this. And at the top of the Instagram account, it's got my profile where I can put a little, I get, you get one teeny little circle where you can put like a profile picture. And I use it to, to put the, the, my three buddies that I run the account with. Um, you get to put the name of your account. You have to pick a, a handle. So this is, you know, you know, what at, you know, the dental journal of uh, Alabama or whatever uh, your handle wanting to pick it out. You can try to be cute like we were. Um, you get to put very little space for text information about your organization. Uh, you know, we had to, we used every line we could to get in this information about us. And then you get one one place to put a website to link to. Um, you have your feed, which is where all the pictures, that, so an individual post is just a picture or a group of up to 10 pictures that you can post, or you can post a video of up to 60 seconds. Um, and you post these this content and it's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that you make little, uh, I mean, you can post things that aren't squares, but um, most of the pictures and the content that people post on Instagram are these little uh, squares. 
And you, again, you within, you know, you post the picture and also some text around it. In those texts, you write a little bit of a little blurb about it and you can use these hashtags and the at signs. Um, to call these reels, I call them stories. I didn't, I didn't realize they were called reels. He's probably, he, I'm sure he's the expert, he's right. Uh, within Instagram, if you, if you click on someone's profile picture and they've chose to upload a, a story, a story is content that's available for 24 hours and then it goes away. And that's why I said it's like Snapchat. I guess that's what Snap, um, Snapchat is. Uh, I always thought Snapchat was for posting inappropriate pictures because they only last for, I think, I thought they lasted for a couple of seconds, but, um, but stories, I guess, are, you know, they last for 24 hours. And a lot of times what, you know, the stuff I put on a post is there forever. And so I work a lot at to make the pictures look really pretty on a story is just there for 24 hours. So I can put out stuff that's more topical, just something I'm thinking about during the day. I might put out five stories and, you know, I might advertise for a course or um, so, but they're available for 24 hours. You can put, you know, once you have 10,000 followers, you can put links in your stories. I think actually now they're letting any, everybody put links in their stories so that people, you know, if you want to say, Hey, check out, then this newest article we posted, here's a picture of it and here's a link, click on this and you can get directed towards that article. Um, and then polls, polls are pretty neat. Uh, Tim showed a poll. So we'll do polls uh, where we'll ask questions like uh, a lot of clinical questions. And, you know, I mean, we're lucky because uh, we've got pretty good engagement where some, you know, we'll get over a thousand people respond to a poll um, you know, and it's, and it, we get it instantly in 24 hours, you know, we get the poll completed and they show us the results of the poll as it's going on. So people are incentivized to answer the poll because then they get to see in real time how other people have answered that poll. So it's a pretty fun way to interact with users. And then the newest thing on Instagram was something called Instagram TV. And this got to be really popular, um, over, uh, a quarantine period of time. And I think a lot of, uh, there's, there's people that have started HBO television shows based on uh, Instagram TV uh, series that they did over the quarantine period. And these are basically you go live with one other person and that just means like they turn on their Instagram, you turn on yours and it records. Uh, uh, it used to be up to only an hour, but now I think they can go beyond an hour conversation you have with someone else. And a lot of times people can take a picture of their computer and they'll give a little lecture or, you know, it's a great, it's a great, kind of interviewing type of video. And like I said, ours, you know, we in during the height of the pandemic, we get some videos that were six, five, six thousand people will watch these uh these videos. Um and they were they were, I think they've they continue to be pretty, pretty big. People will will do these Instagram TV interviews. I'm gonna skip over this photography hacks thing if it's okay. Um I don't think it's gonna be real, it's gonna be interesting for everyone. These are just some of the things that you know, to make my, to make engaging content, I, I've, I've always kind of been into photography. So, but the photography has really helped make the, our Instagram content. Um, so I'm just going to end here with maybe a little bit about how to create, how I think creating an engaging, particularly Instagram um, content. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a really big account. I think they have a couple hundred thousand followers. Uh, they, you can tell that it's like some degree between being professional content, but not seeming like overly, uh, like uh, commercial, uh, you know, you could tell that this is an individual making this, but they've really put a lot of attention to detail and making all their pictures look, uh, perfect. And they have consistent style where, you know, you have the color palettes and the, and the way that they shoot things, you know, with these three lines or, you know, they've, it's just everything about the, the content they've posted has consistency and it's high quality. This is a 3M's website, a 3M's Instagram page, and they've done a nice uh, job here. They have have consistent style. I mean, you could tell, obviously, it's a little more uh, commercial, um, but, you know, I think they've done a nice job as, as a corporate entity of, of making an Instagram page. This was someone's Instagram page I pulled off that I found. It's like one, it was terrible. They have like five people following it. And they, I don't even know why they, they do this. They have, I think, uh, almost like a hundred posts that uh, no one has looked at. And they just get stock images and they just post them. You know, if it's Thanksgiving, they post uh happy Thanksgiving and they have no pictures of any, I don't know, maybe that is one of their patients they took, uh, but it's just like a very, it's like in that kind of like Tim was saying, if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing and you post something like this, it's kind of almost just a waste of time. Um, 
So keys to engaging posts for Instagram photography needs to be pretty good. Uh, it's, it's good to have consistent style and, and font. And, and also, you know, I, I think post, you know, if you look at like this guy's post, everything's, everything's pretty s simple. Uh, even in 3M's post, everything's pretty simple. These ones are, you know, this will look at all, all the stuff that's going on in this, this post. It's, it's just not your typical Instagram uh, uh, post. Um, and then again, like I told you, I'm not a professional at all on this. I'm coming very much from like a, you know, a, a hobbyist. Um, so I did a lot of things on the cheap. Uh, there's a company called Fiverr. Uh, I, I, my brother-in-law is a graphic designer and he hates this site because he thinks it's, it's, it's undercutting his profession, but you can go on and you get people to make logos for you, do different graphic designer type tasks for you. And they do it. It's called Fiverr because some of them do it for $5, $10, $15. So I had people in here make logos for us and, you know, cartoonize things for me. And it's been, it's a, you know, it's all pretty cheap. And even if it doesn't work, I will, I'm only out five or $10. Um, and then most of the content I make, people always ask, how do you make your content? Like I make a lot of cartoons and stuff. And I'll make it all just in Keynote or PowerPoint and just um, animate. Uh, I mean, um, sometimes I make animated videos or just cartoons. And this is a hobby of mine. And, and I'll do it on either Keynote uh, or PowerPoint. And then finally, I'll tell you one of the biggest pain in the butts of Instagram is that it's not really set up for the for it's not made to be easy. It's made for millennials and Gen Zs that you know don't like to use computers. They do everything on their their phone. And I, you know, even though I'm pretty young, like I, I not that I'm not that enamored with my phone. Um, like I'd rather be able. I wish I could just do this all on my laptop. Uh, so essentially, what I have to do is I have to create all the content on my laptop, and then I email it to myself. And then I open up on my phone, download on my phone and upload everything to Instagram. So I don't think there's an easier way to do this. So you gotta be, you gotta manage a lot of this off of your cell phone. So I just went through it, you know, since I, I'm, uh, you know, speaking to journal editors, I was trying to think of, you know, of, of see if there's journals that, um, you know, uh, you know, one I could have put up here would have been like Compendium. I mean, uh, Compendium Inside Dentistry and the Aegis Group has has gotten on social media pretty well. This was I don't know, General Prosthetic Dentistry did a neat job of how they you took pictures from their articles and you know realizing that Instagram is a visual medium instead of just you know they've they've posted some pictures you know from uh, their articles to is is engaging content, but um, well, I guess that's not a lot of, uh, I guess that's the, at the end of my <laughs> presentation there. Um, so yeah, hopefully that was okay. And I didn't mess up anything with time. I thought that was fascinating, Nate. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Should I go ahead and take it over? It it's, it's all yours, Teresa. All right. Um, all right. So we've been kind of sitting here for almost like an hour and a half. So uh, if you guys want to like stand up real quick, stretch, move those legs, wake up uh, while I get this up and running. I have to open system preferences so I can give Zoom permission for my screen. Oh, shoot. I've got to quit Zoom in order to give it permission. OK. So keep stretching, I will be back in just a second. All right, I am back. Hopefully I did not miss too much. Let's see if this will work now. I think, I think, can you guys all see that? Yep. 
Perfect. All right. Hello. Um, I am Teresa Pablos. Um, I'm the editor in chief of Dr. Mike Husband, and I am going to talk a little bit today about um, the tremendous power social media has for uh, helping your brand build loyalty and authentic connections. Um, and that's both your personal brand and professional brand. Um, and so before I get started, I ran this presentation by a colleague earlier, and they said I needed to come with a disclaimer. Um, and that is, this is a very millennial presentation. So be prepared for gifts, um, dark satirical humor, and a mean girls reference. Um, unfortunately, I do not have avocado toast to share with all of you today. So it's not that millennial of a presentation. Um, I'm gonna get into all the fancy slides and things in a moment, um, but I wanna kind of make this presentation a little bit more interactive. Um, and so to start, if you have your cell phone, just get it out, open your camera app, and uh, I wanna walk us through a little exercise. If you could take a picture of the screen, uh, I'm gonna take a picture with this. So I, you may see the flash. I don't know what that's on, that's okay. Um, and so if you look at the picture that you took, uh, you know, there's a lot of choices and I kind of just want to use it to like emphasize how much power is in your hand with this device. Um, and so for instance, if you posted this picture to social media, the one you just took, uh, do you write out a quote? Uh, how accurate is that quote? Is that quote relevant? Why does your audience care about it? Uh, do you tag me? Uh, and if so, how are you going to tag me? Is it my personal account, my professional account? Which networks do you use? Do you tag me in the post itself um, or in the picture? And did you get my name right? In case you do want to tag me, there you go. That's it's Teresa with an H. Um, and so, you know, will you post your summary of the event today and give your own personal interpretations and thoughts and feelings? And will you skip it all together? You say, you know, my audience not interested in this kind of content. Perfectly valuable. Uh, and all of those questions and your answers to them matter, and they're all going to be different because your personal brand, your professional brand is all different and they all matter. Um, and regardless of what they are with this phone, whichever one you have, you have the ability to connect with upwards of billions of people. And that is a lot of power. Um, and what you post, uh, the choices that you make can affect the trust from your audience, whether that's patients, colleagues, dentists, family, and friends. Um, and so it's a lot of power. And as uh, Peter Parker's uh, Uncle Ben, so in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, that's a great line. Maybe you want to share that on social media. Uh, so I'm kind of, kind of making light of the situation, but... Um, I just kind of wanted to emphasize that journalists are using these tools all the time. I have a friend that works for the digital team for NBC in New York, and her professional equipment is an iPhone. It's the exact same as what everyone has at home. And we're getting this power now um, with social media right at the same time that public trust in traditional news institutions has crumbled at record rates and misinformation is spreading like wildfire online. Uh, so your public, your audience is starved for authentic factual content and your brand depends on you thinking like a reporter. And when you do it right, you can build a brand with a loyal following. And so I am going to show you how, but first, who am I? Like I said, I'm Therese Pavlos, Editor-in-Chief of Dr. By Custed. We are a daily uh, news website for the dental community. Uh, I often hear we're one of the fastest to get stories out in the dental news landscape, but uh, I think we're still too slow. We're working on it though. Uh, so what makes us different is that our team is entirely composed of trained journalists. Um, so basically we took classes in writing and ethics and investigative reporting and media law to go into a career that uh, ranks lowest for job satisfaction. And that's, uh, yes, lower than lumberjacks. Uh, according to a series of unscientific surveys from about 10 years ago. Uh, and so I went to J school at the University of Southern California. Um, and I don't get any fancy credentials behind my name, but I do 
get the luxury of randos on the internet telling me everything I'm doing wrong. Maybe some of you editors out there can relate. Um, but I do it because I love connecting with people and I love telling stories and social media is really a great way to do that and to build communities. And I'm going to share with you some of the tips I've learned from my years of journalism experience to make sure that the stories you're telling personally and professionally online on social media are as true and as factual as possible. Um, and so we'll learn some tips um, that journalists use to fact check stories. Um, so you can be even better reporters of the world around you, whether that's just sharing updates with your friends and family or providing information to patients, the dental industry and the world at large. Uh, this includes some fact checking resources and some strategies for combating misinformation online. And there are a lot of cheesy gifts. So yes, I'm gifts with a, a hard G, not like gifs like the peanut butter. I hope that uh, isn't, uh, I hope I don't see anyone like log off because of my take. Um, all right, so here we are. My three tips to build brand loyalty for being a better reporter of the world around you. So number one, share the facts. All right, this next slide, slide I think is gonna really shock you. The social internet has a tax problem. You're probably thinking like, come on, Teresa. I didn't register and sit through like the first two presentations to learn that the internet has a fax problem. Like clearly the internet has a fax problem, but the internet's fax problem is directly related to trust and brand loyalty, especially when it comes to the content you're sharing with your audiences on social media channels. Uh, and here's why. 84% of US adults say they often or sometimes get news from a smartphone, computer, or tablet. Um, that's a statistic from a November 8th report from the Pew Research Center. Uh, Pew Research has already been cited in this. You may be very familiar with it, but in case you're not, uh, Pew conducts wonderful surveys um, that often help reporters and the public glean insights into what Americans are doing, thinking, and feeling. Uh, trust in news and consumption and the media are huge topics right now. Um, and in fact, one of the topics Pew is actually actively studying is news habits and media. Um, and so what else can this Pew study tell us? It's 48% of US adults get their news from social media. One of the other presenters said he gets his news from social media. Um, the younger you are, the more likely you are to get your news from social media. And so for people 18 through 29, the late Gen Xers, early millennials, 71% get their news from social media. Um, and 29% of people in that age range actually prefer to get news from social media than any other source. So uh, a lot of cameras are off but I wanna get a little mean girls on you. And if anyone feels comfortable, uh, either in the comments or you know, showing your face, you could raise your hands if you um, have ever post, uh, sorry, if you, I'm sorry. Hmm. Oh, sorry, if you have a social media account, that was the question, if you have a Facebook page. So Facebook page, Twitter account, YouTube channel, Instagram, Thank you, Nate. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, WhatsApp, Twitch, Tumblr, TikTok, or whatever crazy new app the teenagers are using these days now that their parents are on TikTok. All right, I'm seeing lots of hands here. Uh, don't put your hand down yet. Keep your hand up if you've ever shared anything to any one of those platforms. Hot take, congratulations, you're now a reporter. So with social media, and everyone getting the, not everyone, but a vast half of adults, and then it's gonna increase as uh, time goes on because young people, again, 71% get their news from social media. Uh, social media sites are news platforms. Your social media pages, personal and professional, are a source of news for the people in your life, your patients, your professional audiences, your friends and family. So when you share a picture, a post, or a news story, you are curating your own newsletter of sorts. You are taking what you see and broadcasting it to your personal and professional audiences. You are saying to them, this is important enough to share. No matter whether you're sharing this, 
that's something that uh, Dr. Vicuspe shared on his Facebook page November 15th, or this. And that was our Thanksgiving post. Um, and so you may be thinking like, okay, yes, Teresa, I get it's important to be aware of what I'm sharing on social media, but don't worry, I only share factual information. So it's not really a problem. And to which I would say, but do you? So I'm gonna take you back in a little time capsule. We're all gonna get back in it and go all the way to the year 2015, uh, which is the year that you may remember this dress made the rounds on social media. So some people said this dress was 100% cross my heart and hope to die black and blue. But another large contingent said the dress was 100% cross my heart, hope to die white and gold. Two groups of people looking at the exact same image, reporting on what their eyes were seeing and their brain was interpreting and coming to two completely different conclusions. So who was right? Well, the definition of a fact is a thing that is known and proved to be true. And so in 2015, when the first photo first went viral, a group of fact finders and journalists were able to find the actual color of the dress, spoiler alert, it's black and blue, by reaching out to the original poster. So in this uh, BuzzFeed news article in, from 2015, the uh, reporter reached out to the Caitlin McNeil who posted that dress on Tumblr um, after, I think she was wearing it to a wedding. Um, other news sites also talked to other people who had witnessed the dress, the dress firsthand. Uh, they reached out to her family and could ask, hey, what color was this dress? They also used color programs to find the actual hex code of the dress in the image. And so it was a technology tool that was not your human eyes and brain to confirm through an outside source of, hey, this dress, that is the dress color in the photo. You also have people who were able to find the dresses online retail posting, which is still up to this day. That is how popular that this dress is, uh, but it's still part of the retailer's site. Um, and they did make a limited edition white and gold version of hashtag the dress. And so it's the same tools that all of these people used back in 2015 to figure out what color the dress was uh, are the same kind of tool that we can use in 2021 to identify factual content online. Um, and so first, Look for firsthand sources. Um, so just like with the dress, reaching out to that original poster, um, this is um, this is also if you're looking at um, people who were at an event, for instance, um, and it's really in, invaluable to get that in-person information. Uh, but remember, just like with the dress, our eyes and brains can still deceive us. And so it's important to look for multiple sources of information. Another really key one, and I'm sure dental editors are very familiar of looking for reference material, looking at that data. So when a story is shared by a traditional news site um, or a website that looks like it could be a news site, but you're not sure, high quality journalists um, will often mention who or where they got their information from. So if they publish a fact or a statistic, there will be a link to it. And then you can go look at that information for yourself. For instance, a press conference with a police chief or data from a local health department. Um, and so you can make sure it lines up. And so on Dr. B, this is something that we do and it's really important to us. So we wanna make sure people know where we're getting our information from. Um, and this is especially important with stories related to COVID-19 right now, especially when we're gonna share them on social media. So for instance, that, um, COVID-19 story that I showed you the screenshot of earlier. If you clicked on that story and you looked at it on our site, you can see where we're getting that information from in the very first paragraph. And I've kind of highlighted it in yellow, but it's linked with the date and the journal. And if you actually clicked on that link, it's the DOI and it links back to the journal study. So people know exactly where that information is coming from when they see it on social media. We also cite our images. 
to be as transparent as possible, which is a huge thing for news organizations um, on social media and any kind of editorial publication. And I would argue any even personal account, because like I said, we are all reporters now with the way social media is structured. So back to tips to identify factual content. Tip number three, reference fact-checking websites. So you've looked at firsthand sources, you've checked reference material. An easy way if you uh, are curious about something is just to go look at the people who have done it for you. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight two of my favorites that are run by um, editors and nonpartisan. The first for political things is PolitiFact. Um, this is run by, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning site and it's run by the editors and reporters from the Tampa Bay Times and the, in Florida, the, the newspaper. It's also part of Pointer, Pointer. And so I don't know if you can see underneath PolitiFact, it says the Pointer Institute. Um, that is actually a huge continuing education resource for journalists um, and editors. And so if you're a dental editor and you wanna learn more about topics, if you haven't heard of them, I highly encourage you to look at their site. They have a bunch of stuff on everything from misinformation and fact checking to um, covering events to even style and editing. Um, and so they want run PolitiFact and it's claim to fame and what you may have seen it for is it's pants on fire truth meter when someone, uh, some elected official says something that's absolutely ridiculous. That's what they do. There's also um, a personal favorite of mine is Snopes. Um, it's got such a funny name and it's an invaluable resource for vetting just anything you see on social media or the internet that you're like, that can't be true. Um, it's one of the oldest fact checking sites. Um, and it's been around since 1994, and it originally started as a site for vetting urban legends. Um, and so again, this is a, a screenshot of their write-up on the dress. Um, and as you can see, they were one of the people that used the hex code color to determine the color of the dress. And it gives the article on Snopes for the dress has the full background and everything. And they do that for so many of the myths going around the internet. Um, so those are just two resources to kind of help you fact check if you want to gut check for um, whether you're seeing something, whether it's true or not. And then uh, finally, my last tip for identifying factual content is look for sites um, to see if they have a code of ethics po posted. So many journalism organizations require their staff to follow codes of ethics. It's very possible that many of you work for organizations that require codes of ethics. Um, I know for some fin uh, financial editors who work for financial publications, for instance, they're not, um, their code of ethics bars them from trading individual stocks and things like that. Um, true story, I don't know how many of you went to J school, but uh, journalism school, but if you did, I had, you may have taken an investigative reporting class. And in my investigative reporting class, one of our classes, uh, we had a guest speaker from someone who lost his career in journalism because he published a story over a bad tip. Um, he wrote it up too quickly and didn't do his due diligence. And he was still working 20 years later to rebuild his reputation over one story published too soon. Um, and so codes of that's breaking the code of ethics of his publication. And so sites with codes of ethics take them very seriously. Um, Dr. Bicuspid does not have one yet, we are a pretty small team if we grow, and I'm sure we will add one. But um, personally, I'm part of the Society of Professional Journalists. If you are an editor, you may be able to join too. Um, and so I am bound to the SPJ Code of Ethics, which includes things like, I wrote a list so I can tell you some of the cool things, taking special care to not misrepresent or oversimplify in promoting, previewing, or summarizing the story. Um, recognizing that legal access to information differs from ethical justification to publish or broadcast it, uh, labeling sponsored content, updating information throughout the life of a news story. Um, and so things like that, where it's really just having high standards for the industry, and then also having accountability if you break those standards. Um, and so journalists that work for publications, reporters that do work for these kinds of publications, there is accountability when they work for a site that has a code of ethics. 
Um, moving on, tip number two. So again, that was tip number one, tell the truth on social media. So now we're on tip number two, combat misinformation. And so, well, you know, sharing facts on social media is great and it's needed. It's by far the only thing you'll ever share, want to share with your audiences personally or professionally. Um, if you're like me, uh, you like to post pictures and I really like to, for instance, post way too many pictures of my dog. Uh, like way too many pictures of my dog. Like he has his own Instagram page, <laughs> uh, pictures of my dog. Um, and you know, sharing more than just pure cold hard facts is part of the magic of the internet. It's part of what makes it a quirky, lovely place at times. And for instance, through my dog's Instagram page, I've connected with people in real life in LA who were like, oh, I saw your dog and I have this dog. And we also know this other random mutual person, like let's meet up. Um, and so it's wonderful um, and it can be lovely, but um, there's a downside to the candor and personality and that's sometimes it can be hard to tell fact for, from opinion, um, which is why my first point to combat misinformation is brush up on fact first opinion. And so here's why. Um, going back to our friends at Pew Research Center in a June 2018 report, Pew examined whether roughly 5,000 adults could uh, recognize whether news was factual. And so like, I think I have that definition here. Yeah, um, a fact is a thing, again, known to be, that is known or proved to be true. So there has to be evidence um, versus an opinion, which is a view or judgment formed about something. So again, it can be based on facts. It doesn't have to be, um, but it's more of the interpretation of the, of the facts. And so Pew asked the 5,000 people whether these 10 statements were facts or opinion, they included things that were like spending on social security, Medicare, Medicaid, make up the largest portion of the US federal budget um, versus for instance, government is almost uh, always wasteful and inefficient. And so Pew in their write-up of the results of this said they expected this to be a basic task. Um, but as you watching this presentation may not be surprised to hear, uh, the results show that the assignment was anything but easy. And so just 26% of adults could correctly identify all five factual statements. Um, and 35% of adults could correctly identify all five opinions pieces. Um, and so while the majority were able to tell um, fact from opinion in at least three questions out of the five in each set. Uh, that may sound better than it is because Pew said, this result is only a little better than random guesses, which is womp, 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 not a great. Um, I was kind of disheartened because when I'm sharing a story that's news, I want my audience to have, you know, better than a guess of knowing that it's news versus opinion and vice versa. Um, there were some things that were interesting. Um, for instance, Democrats were a little bit better at categorizing facts from opinion, but not by much. Um, and rather than political party, um, people of both political parties were likely to be swayed by statements that aligned with their political views. Um, people who got answers correct, instead of, again, being related to political party, were more likely to be digital savvy, have a lot of trust in the news media, and have high political awareness. Um, and people who are younger also tended to perform better. Um, that one also surprised me that younger people were better at spotting uh, fact versus opinion online. Um, so I was a little astounded, but I wasn't really surprised um, because around the time that this came out, I was hearing a lot from my wonderful father. This is him in full 1970s fashion. Um, and so I love him, but right around the time, again, 2017, 2018, he would start, he started sending me articles and asking like, hey, are these factual? I just, I don't know what to believe with everything, all this misinformation going around. And like, my dad's no dummy. He's got an MBA. He works in finance. He knows numbers. He's an analysis guy. And so I actually, I sat down with him and all, I walked him through uh, how to tell which stories are fact, which are opinion, which 
don't seem like they have uh, as much of a group uh, grounding in factual reality. And uh, because all of you were so kind to show up today, I'll tell you what I told Sam. Tips to identify factual content. Hopefully the slide looks familiar. We just covered it. Um, it's the same tools for when you are vetting a story on whether you want to share it with your audiences. You can also use to say to see whether something could be misinformation, the firsthand sources, the reference material, uh, the fact checking websites and codes of ethics. Um, regardless, in the Internet age, it is getting harder to tell fact from opinion for many people. The lines are getting blurrier and worse, it seems like when doing my research for this, there are more websites with bad intentions that are actually trying to take advantage of the fact that people are struggling to identify the difference between facts and opinions. Um, and it's just one of many things pushing people into misinformation rabbit holes. So if uh, you are looking for more information on how to brush up on fact first opinion, um, I can send you links um, for different tools. Um, but again, editors, I have a feeling you are probably more familiar with fact and opinion than maybe uh, your friends and family or the audiences um, you are trying to reach. And so we can help them because we know that it's harder for people to distinguish between fact and opinion online by appropriately labeling our content. So when we put something out into the world, through a newsletter, on social media, we can really help our audience if we can help tell them, hey, this is an opinion piece or this is something editorial and factual. Um, on Dr. Bicuspid, we label our opinion pieces pretty clearly in the title. We call them second opinion pieces. That way our audience knows, for instance, we reporters at Dr. Bicuspid are not saying dental therapists are the key to making Medicare work. That, that's not what we're saying. We didn't, nope, <laughs> it's not a study. It's not factual. This is an opinion piece by, this one's by Dr. Frank uh, Catalanato. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and so that is, that is his thoughts. And you may agree with them, you may not, but it is an opinion and we try to make that as clear as possible. Um, there's another kind of uh, piece that's going, growing, I feel like increasingly prominent on social media. And that are, those are paid promotions and sponsored promotions and paid content in general. And so uh, I couldn't find one. Dr. My husband does do paid social ads. I couldn't find one for the slide deck. So I just. The uh, they have a sponsored label. Um, and I know on Instagram, if you're doing a paid partnership with an Instagram influencer, uh, that again, you can label that as paid content and it shows up in pretty much the same place on Instagram, right underneath the brand or profile name. And so it's just making it a little easier to share with your audience. Like this is not a hundred percent. It may be factual, but you know, there are other things going on that you need to consider when you're looking at this content. Um, and it's being pushed to you for a reason um, and try to make it a little bit clear when there's money involved um, when it comes to content. So Dr. Mike has bid for our newsletters. We, um, do, we do do paid newsletters. Um, and so for instance, companies can pay us um, and we will do a newsletter. Um, and so this one is Fuse um, by, I think it's Patterson. I'm pretty sure it uses Patterson. Um, and so, for instance, we actually have, before you can read the article, a page with a big sponsored by. So you know that this is not 100%. Like, it, it is factual. So this, this is actually, I grabbed this screenshot before, um, one of our editorial pieces where our editorial team did write up the article. But... We wrote up the article because it was part of a sponsored newsletter. And so the article itself, Patterson had no hand in, but I still, it's important to let our audience know how paid relationships not work, but you know, to know that we have to get paid to, um, that there is a, just a disclaimer of like, hey, you deserve to know, we wanna be transparent. This is sponsored by. 
uh, very rarely we do um, sponsored content. And when we do, again, we put that label kind of like on Facebook. This is sponsored. You should know. We trust you, our audience. Hopefully you trust us. We want to be as transparent as possible. Um, there are lots of types of additional newsletter labels. Um, this is from the San Diego Union Tribune. It's just a few of the kinds that they have pulled out. Um, and so other ways you can label content, news story, which is something done by reporters, which is again, people bound to code of ethics. Editorial, it's opinions about matters of public in interest by editors. Again, bound by code of ethics. Column, reporting commentary and opinions made by a col columnist who sometimes are bound by code of ethics. Not always. Um, news uh, analysis, which is not just the facts, but also facts with like context, for instance, data or trends. Um, and then that is a typo, it should say op-ed, not open-ed, but opinion pieces. Um, and again, opinion pieces and someone not in the news, someone not bound by a code of ethics. And so this is all very formal and I feel like more for uh, when you're working professionally, you're probably not going to put, like I wouldn't put on my dog's Instagram page, like this is an opinion piece, but you can still signal to your followers when you know something is more opinion based um, rather than pure up cold hard facts. And some of that is easy by doing things like, I think, I feel, I value, just simple statements to show, hey, this is my personal opinion and not cold hard fact. There's also this kind of like reverse question mark, um, which I've seen a few times and I, it's been pr proposed uh, as a way to like denote comments that are ironic or sarcastic. And so people don't take something at face value. Uh, I don't know if that will gain traction. Uh, I have a feeling more likely what that will happen is social media platforms will start building in ways to kind of denote sarcasm or whatnot. Uh, and who knows, maybe one day social media platforms will actually build in ways to denote the kind of news content it is so their algorithms can get better, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, so another way to combat misinformation is to admit when you mess up. Sometimes it is hard out there. There is some content that looks like perfectly legit and it is not. Um, in terms of editorially, when it comes to social media, I know, for instance, I have a personal weakness with headlines um, for care for like site character limits. It's pretty low; it's like fifty five characters, um, and that means sometimes, like a lot of times, sometimes. Well, I mean, anyway, nuance gets lost, um, and that's difficult. And I feel like that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, you know, you you. It's probably seen people share stories and then like they don't realize what they're sharing because they only shared it based on the headlines. Uh, chances are that headline did not capture that whole story and maybe it leaned a little bit more sensational. Um, and so headlines I think are a common problem across the web. Um, and I think part of that is also because sensational headlines are kind of tempting to write because they do so well for engagement and the algorithms um, which I know got talked about a little bit earlier, um, but it's really important to bring up the algorithms. The way to combat misinformation is you can try and hack the algorithms. Um, so on social media platforms, we are all at the mercy of them. So like, let's go back to our like time capsule 2015, right? So that was the year of the dress. That was, to put it in perspective, guys, 2015 was before Baby Shark. The internet was a much more peaceful, beautiful place back then. <laughs> um, back in 2015, Twitter and Instagram, they still posted content in chronological order. That means you saw stuff from your friends. Remember back when you used to see stuff from your friends on social media before, uh, before the algorithms changed? Um, it was wonderful. And so then in 2016, Twitter and Instagram joined Facebook and Google and YouTube and all of the other websites and uh, changed their algorithms to prioritize what the algorithm thought was great. And it showed, or, uh, so yep, the almighty algorithm. And so 
the algorithms are all a little bit different and it is important as mentioned earlier to kind of try and create content that people will see and react to to appease the algorithms and so for instance um, if you have a blog or a website like on Dr. By Cuspid, we try to do fancy things with headlines and links to bo boost our search engine optimization to appease the Google algorithm and end up higher in Google search results. You have a YouTube channel, you make a pretty thumbnail and fill out your video description and make a catchy title and upload a video longer than two minutes and attempt to, to please the YouTube algorithm and uh, end up higher up in their results. If you have Instagram, you look at optimal posting times and tagging relevant users and hashtags. Um, for instance, you can upload up to 20 hashtags to appease the Instagram al algorithm and better satisfy your followers. Um, the whole problem with this is that the algorithms end up being weighted for anger, shock, frustration, uh, which translates to misinformation. They call it, and again, this was described earlier, engagement, content that does well, you know, when it gets a lot of clicks, when it gets a lot of comments, when it gets a lot of likes, when viewers watch a long portion of the video and stay and read the whole article. Um, Great in theory, great in numbers and data, but what has happened and what we've seen happen on the internet starting around 2016 is content that is controversial soars right to the top. Content that is well researched and nuanced, not so much. Um, and what's happened is these algorithms have resulted in an increasingly rabbit hole, misinformed, parallel universe like existence on social media. And but like Twitter, you can still go back to chronological order. That's what I do. I am I'm very much against the algorithmic view on Twitter. I look in chronological order. But Facebook got rid of that feature years ago. Yeah, you can only look at through a algorithm lens. And so that's what your viewers are gonna have too. Um, and it's kind of frustrating because you can be doing everything right and moral and not get that traction and not get, it, get that engagement quite at the same level as if you were not. Um, and so again, what you can do about it, hack the algorithms. So my favorite example is my really uh, weird niche YouTube community vlog brothers. So this is in 2016, again, right around, around this turning point in the internet where everything kind of changed on the social internet. Um, and so in this video, one of the two vlog brothers, Hank Green, um, actually asks the members of the YouTube community to post the plus sign in the comment section if they like the video, because the YouTube algorithm weighs comments a lot higher than likes. Again, it's that engagement. And so right before this video posted, the comment section was filled with, at the very top, with things that felt like, to me, read very much like personal attacks on the Green Brothers, things that tended to be more negative, things that tended to be really controversial because they drew in a bunch of comments that responded and led to those whole dumpster fires you probably see of, of just a bunch of arguing. Um, and so after they implemented that change, when most of the comments are just plus signs, the comment section became so much more productive and positive and even now, years later, you'll still see plus signs in the comments of the Vlogbrothers YouTube channel. That was just their way to kind of hack the algorithm. Uh, it's not an ideal solution by, by any means, but until we can find ways to make more sustainable social media, um, until they change the algorithm, for instance, maybe allowing you to label type of content, um, it's just gonna be trying to find creative ways to again, let people know this is, how we're gonna try and create positive community and share positive, truthful things. Um, which brings me to my last point, which is be authentic. I almost put this as be kind because being kind is so, so important. Um, but I think being authentic covers that too. The internet is a minefield, rife with misinformation, a lack of facts, and an ability to tell factual from non-factual content star unless you've taken this course. Thank you to all of you who are still here. Um, and the last thing we need is to run communities and post contest, content that produce more um, divisiveness and then also confusion. 
Um, fortunately, I think again, most of the people in the dental community, I haven't seen much that seems that way, which is great. And it's one of the reasons I really love being part of the dental community. Um, and so keep up that authenticity, keep up that kindness and keep up being you. And so I'm crazy. So in addition to running Dr. Mike Husband, I produce a podcast. It's called Mission Driven Business. One theme that consistently comes up when, um, so these are small business owners. Um, and so they're often thinking about social media from a marketing standpoint. Um, the thing that I've been surprised that has kept coming up is the power of values and authenticity as a marketing tool. Um, people are starved for factual and authentic content. Um, if that's something you're interested in, the Humane Marketing episode with Sarah Sandicaras um, talks a lot about that. And again, small communities of where you're reaching people who have your values. It's not going for the billions of people on social media. It's like, if you have a hundred people who have all of those same values as you, that is it, it's incredibly valuable. Um, and so you need to find the, the people that are gonna resonate with you in these communities. Um, I think authenticity is one of the reasons on Dr. By Cuspid, we have a video series called Dental Nurse. Um, and I think authenticity is one of the reasons like it keeps showing up in the top 10 for us, um, which is amazing. And I think it's part of it is like, I'm a freaking goofball who grew up watching way too much YouTube. Um, and pharmacologist, uh, Tom Viola, it makes wonderful, horrible, wonderful <laughs> dad jokes while talking about pharmacy facts. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about facts, but we don't use newscaster voices. I'm probably breaking like 90% of the rules I learned in broadcast journalism school, but our audience loves it and has responded to it and is engaged with us. And I think one of the reasons for that is because we're being real and authentic. People don't want newscaster voices. They want real people. They want to know who you are and what you value. And so um, that also helps not fall into the misinformation trap because you are being authentic um, online. So there's two tips for being authentic that I have, which is one, define your values and two, run anything you post by them. And so uh, I, I made this slide, I, a few people I was thinking about. We all know someone who is the most upright, pleasant, kind, accepting person in, in person when you're seeing their face. And then you see what they post on social media and what they say to people and you're like, who are you online? Like, this is not who I know that you are. Like, no, don't be that person. Uh, instead, think about like, if you were in person, trying to reach your audience, your friends, your families, your patients, the dental community, would you say this to their face? I think is a really great, easy way to kind of define a value and run something you post by, by it. Um, you can even go so far as to define your own personal code of ethics or value statements um, and run anything you post by those. You don't have to be part of the Society of Professional Journalists to live by a code of ethics. Um, each of you watching will have your own sense of what is moral and valuable and uh, taking the time to kind of reflect on that uh, will help you share authentic, valuable information with your personal professional audiences. So I wanna share what I use um, for sharing personal and professional content, um, which is, it's, I took it directly from this clock tower. Um, it's in Silicon Valley in the town of San Bruno. I used to live there. San Bruno coincidentally is the uh, city with, with the headquarters for YouTube, um, which is I think kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah, I got this from, from there, but it's called the four-way test. And it says of the things we think say or do, and then I would say also or share with their audiences on social media. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? So to recap, uh, my three tips to build brand loyalty and be a better reporter of the world around you. One, tell the truth. We now have some tips on how to do that. Two, combat misinformation. Again, it is surprisingly hard in the digital age, but 
there are again tools and resources that can help you make sure you're sharing the best information you can. Three, be authentic, be yourself, respond with audiences. It's not always about numbers. That's about recognizing who you are and your community. So I believe if you do these things in this modern era of social media, your community will reward you. Um, on Dr. Bicuspid, to me, one of the most important statistics is 92% of our audience trusts our reporting. And that like excludes, we asked an other, like 7% of people filled in an other when we asked this on our survey earlier this year. And most of them said, oh, we trust your reporting, but we don't always trust like the second opinions on your site. <laughs> Perfectly valuable. valuable. So I think that percentage is actually like a little higher, but that's still really high and something I don't take for granted, especially when going back to wonderful Pew data. Um, Pew shows that only 58% of adults trust national news organizations, 75% of adults trust local news organizations. It's astounding that, and again, I'm very grateful that our audience has that much trust in us. Um, do we always get it right? No. Like I said, sometimes my headlines uh, don't have enough nuance, may lean a little bit sensational. Uh, and our audience is not shy to let me know on social media and in my email inbox uh, that I need to rein it back in. Um, but that's because they trust me and they trust us as editors and they're part of this community and their feedback is valuable. And I know at Dr. Bike Husband, we're fortunate to have a community that can hold us to such high standards and such high standards that I want us want to be held accountable to and that I want us to meet, even when it is randos on the internet telling me everything I'm doing wrong. Um, and so in 2020, news websites and brands, um, dental journals are more than just places to curate news. They're the hearts of online communities. There's enough toxicity. Let's create spaces that are factual, trustworthy, and foster community on and offline. After all, when it comes to social media, we're all reporters now. Thanks. All right, I think there are going to be questions. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all three of our presenters, Tim, Dr. Lawson, and Teresa, for their, their fine programs tonight. And the floor is open for questions right now. I think uh, um, Tim stepped out, but uh, Teresa and hopefully Dr. Lawson are on board to answer your question. So uh, if you can uh, raise your um, your hand, I, I'll look for it, so. I just wanted to say, because uh, of Nate with the whole stories versus reels. So stories are those 24 hour things, Nate, that are like Snapchat, where like if you click on a profile, um, they disappear and stuff. Reels are a whole other new separate tab in Instagram that is like competing with TikTok. It is confusing because they're both video and you can use reels to add to your stories and it's just a whole interesting mess, but it's fun. <laughs> I've got a question from Teresa. Um, I think I know, I think you told us what disqualifies a, a story or an article. Uh, have you ever published a story you wished you hadn't? Oh, that's a good question. Publish a story I wish I hadn't. Not off the top of my head, um, fortunately, um, because once something in this modern internet era, once you let something out of the, uh, you can't put it back in the bottle. Um, and so that's something I think quite a bit about. And again, that's a big point of, uh, a whole section of like the SPJ code of ethics is when to not publish something. Um, and so as of now, I can't think of anything that I published that I wish I hadn't. Um, hopefully, knocking on wood, it stays that way. Well, it, it happens in, in publishing, uh, so. <laughs> Let's see, what story needs to be told? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. 
That was from the comment section. Um, hmm, what story needs to be told? I feel like we, at least on Dr. Bright Husband, need to do a better job of telling the stories of uh, people who are like on the front lines of dentistry. Um, we talk with a lot of industry people, um, a lot of dental editors, a lot of the really big thinkers and the think tanks and uh, the decision makers, which is great. It's important. They know trends. They can see things that uh, other people can't. But I really, I love people and I feel like it's really valuable to hear what's going on in like the day-to-day -day dentistry side, the people who are practicing and seeing patients um, and what's their stresses and um, what's going on with them, particularly with dentistry. It's going into huge shifts right now. So how are they responding to it in their day-to-day -day practice is something that's really interesting. Um, and also I think more content for younger dentists. Again, as, uh, before this webinar, we were talking a little bit about like student loans. Um, that's something I think that needs to be told um, probably through a more um, profile-y like piece, like following someone, like what does it actually mean to be graduating with so much student loans after a pandemic and everything going on? But I'd be curious if anyone else has any other takes on what should be, what story needs to be told. I had a question I was going to ask Tim and um, Dr. Lawson, but I, I don't I don't know if uh, Dr. Lawson's still on, but uh, it had to do with my question was private groups. Mm. And yeah. on Facebook. And, and, yeah, yeah. Um, my, my question was uh, or actually it's a two part question. Should every publication have one and should publications try to join closed groups? Yeah, I'd be really interested to hear his answer on that. Um, it's something I've played doing on Dr. By Cuspid for a while now, We're creating like a Dr. By Cuspid closed group. Um, because like I'm a member of various closed groups and I find them extremely valuable, but it would have to be very right close, like creating a closed group that there isn't already like a need for. Um, my gut feeling is probably it doesn't hurt to try and have a closed group. I don't think you need one, but I, if you wanna get feedback from your community, could be one way to do that in addition to potentially surveys and stuff. Um, and then as for joining a publication, joining the existing closed groups, I think it's gonna depend on the rules of the closed group. Um, some I don't think would like that. Um, others would probably be really welcoming. Uh, you would, uh, my gut feeling is you would probably have better luck though using your personal account and then just being transparent. Like, hey, I'm Therese Pablo, editor in chief of Dr. Mike Cuspid. Would like to join your account so I can just kind of see what's going on and see what's interesting you. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I know. I noticed both uh, Tim and Dr. Lawson mentioned it, so I, I, I thought I would just kind of follow up on them. I know we've written a lot of stories this year, um, or at least it feels like I've edited a lot of stories this year of um, people who have mentioned these closed groups as education resources and how valuable they've been. Again, these are practicing dentists and hygienists for um, just learning information and getting gut checks on patients and apparently looking for referrals and things like that. So it definitely seems to be um, becoming more popular. Um, and I'm glad to hear it seems like it's useful for um, the community. Any, any other questions this evening? I have one for the people in the audience. I was curious, um, okay. like I asked before. Um, did anyone, I was curious so through your background, like did anyone else go to journalism school um, for editing? I um, wasn't quite sure. Hmm. Yeah. Oh. That's me. It, it doesn't seem like many people who end up in dental, dental editing kind of stuff have gone to journalism school. You come more from like the science side, which is really cool. Any other questions from the audience tonight? If not, I, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, especially uh, Susan Pittman from the ACD office in Rockville for all her help in putting together this program tonight. 
without her, this would not have happened. And I, again, I want to thank our three presenters. I want to thank uh, Tim, Dr. Lawson, and Teresa for their, their efforts tonight. I'm grateful to it. So uh, I wish everyone a good evening and a good weekend. And uh, I'm, we're going to sign off and uh, if there are no, no other questions. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you.